So case number one, I'll just start right out with, this is a case that turned out really well, but it's a nice case just as an intro to the topic of ACS and STEMI because it gives us a chance to talk about some, some basic approaches and, and, and basic definitions for STEMI. This is a case that was sent to me by a physician in India. He had a 50 year old man who presented with chest pain and history of hypertension. I'm not going to give you the rest of the history. Let's just say it was a concerning presentation. So we're going to get a 12 lead. And this was the original 12 lead, not all in large parts of this that are relevant. It's 11.22 p.m. And just as a little background, he's at a community hospital. There's no cath lab. And cardiology is at home. If he decides this patient needs acute reperfusion therapy, in other words, lytics, they use streptokinase. So as you look at this, this patient's presenting with a concerning presentation, and here's the 12 lead. The question for you is, would you give this patient thrombolytics, All right? Now, the leads that were most concerning were the inferior leads, so I'm going to blow those up for you. And as you look at these inferior leads, my question to you is, would you give the patient thrombolytics? Would, do you think that this patient qualifies as what we typically refer to as a STEMI? Now, when I've shown this case in, in front of live audiences, so let's say there's 100 people in the audience, typically there's about five or 10 people that'll raise their hand and say, yeah, I think I would go ahead and give thrombolytics, but most people's hands are down. There's no wrong answers here. Um, and, you know, it's it, it might be a reasonable thing to do. There's a concerning presentation. There's some concerns here as well, uh, especially when you look down there, say at lead three, it kind of looks like, there's some concerns. And then AVL has some ST segment depression. Most people say no in terms of defining this as a STEMI because there's really not ST elevation in two contiguous leads. So, um, you know, and lead three is the most concerning. And even then it's a little bit uncertain. Where exactly are you supposed to measure the, the for ST segment elevation? And some of these leads even have a little bit of, uh, of an S wave. <clears throat> And so it becomes a bit more, more confusing. So if you have a 12 lead ECG that's not diagnostic, as most people would say that this is not diagnostic of a STEMI, but you have a concerning presentation, what should you do, right? Well, you're going to get a repeat 12 lead ECG. And that phrase, get a repeat 12 lead ECG, I hope to burn into your minds as we go through this course, repeat ECGs. I'm a, such a huge believer and repeat ECGs because these really do save lives and make diagnoses. And that's exactly what Dr. Chinana did. Probably 20, 25 minutes later, he gets a repeat 12 lead and I'll blow up the inferior leads for you. Here's the repeat 12 lead. And now when you look at these inferior leads, if I'm in a live audience, I typically will ask people, how many of you would thrombolyze a patient right now? And now with this repeat ECG, almost all the hands typically rise because now the patient does appear to have ST elevation, a little bit more clear cut in lead three and also in lead AVF. So two contiguous leads. There's also perhaps some reciprocal depression up there, which was present on the prior 12 lead also, by the way. All right. And that's exactly what Dr. Chanana did. He gave the patient streptokinase. And again, this is a good outcome. Um, he gave the patient streptokinase Cardiology was consulted. And they agreed with that decision. Troponin came back a little bit later, and it's markedly positive. So this was a true STEMI. Troponins rose, and the patient ended up doing well. Nine months later, they followed up the patient. He's got a good EF. His wall motion abnormality is, is pretty much resolved. And um, so, again, this is a good outcome. Um, but the question is that the reason I like to present this is just to pose some Rhetorical questions for this virtual audience. Is there ST elevation in, in that first 12 lead ECG? And I think most people say, well, there's really not. It's really tough to see any ST segment elevation. And then the second question is, where exactly are you supposed to measure the ST segment elevation? You know, do you measure, for example, in this impulse right there, do you measure at the J point, which is right there? Or do you measure 40 milliseconds later, which is right there? Or do you measure 60 milliseconds later? And I've heard people recommend all of these, even within the past year. I still hear some people say, you're supposed to measure the, the J point, measure the ST elevation of 40 milliseconds later. That's what I learned when I was in residency. And I, I've heard some people say 60 milliseconds 
afterwards as well. And then in some of these complexes, where exactly are you going to measure it? Are you measuring the ST segment elevation right there? Is that is that the J point right there? Or is that the J point? It becomes a little bit concerning. So let's talk a little bit about that. To, to get this answer, I'm going to take you to the fourth universal definition of myocardial infarction. This is probably the gold standard paper on how we're supposed to define STEMI in the year 2023. This is published in 2018. The preceding one back in 2012 uh, said the same thing that we're about to talk about. And even the second universal definition, which was about five years earlier, said the same thing. So for at least 10, 15 years or longer, they've made the same recommendations that we're about to talk about. So this is not new information, believe it or not. All right. So first of all, what what they clearly say is that we're supposed to use the J point. The J point is where we measure ST segment elevation. And that's your J point. The J point is exactly where the QRS ends and the ST segment begins. It's the terminal point of the QRS complex. So we've got an RS and that's where the QRS complex ends. And that is your J point. And that is where you measure for ST segment elevation. All right. So when we look at that first 12 lead ECG, is there ST elevation in two contiguous leads? And I think we'd have to say, no, there's not. There's really not ST elevation in contiguous leads in that first one. Right. Now, the next question is, how much ST segment elevation do you need? When I was in residency, I learned in the inferior leads, one millimeter, in the precordial leads, two millimeters. That's not right. And then a few years later, they said, you know what? Let's make it simple. Instead of one millimeter, two millimeter, let's make it all one millimeter. If you have one millimeter ST elevation in two contiguous leads, that defines STEMI. That's not correct either. For the past 15 years at least, the universal definition, by the way, the universal definition is a collaboration of cardiologists from the European Society of Cardiology, American College of Cardiology Foundation, American Heart Association, the World Health Federation. This is how STEMI is supposed to be defined in the universe on Pluto, all right, in the Crab Nebula. This is how STEMI is supposed to be defined across the entire universe. Apparently, when the Americans and Europeans get together, they believe they represent the universe. So be it, all right? But this is how we're supposed to be defining STEMI. ST elevation, you need one millimeter in two contiguous leads, but in V2 and V3, it depends on age and gender. In V2 and V3, it's different. In V2 and V3, men over 40, you need two millimeters. Men under 40, you need two and a half millimeters. And in women in V2, V3, it's one and a half millimeters. All right. How many people knew that? I think word is slowly getting around, but this oftentimes I still don't even see this in the board review books. But this is how STEMI has been defined according to the universal definition since probably before 2010, for sure. And for whatever reason, we've all been taught, just worry about one millimeter. It's not actually that simple. Well, you know, STEMI is not that simple um, because of these changes. So there's a few other things that can actually help improve our yield in picking this up. You know, looking at this, a lot of people are concerned about this lead right there, specifically that ST segment, the way it appears to be shaped. During this course, I'm going to teach you to look for reciprocal changes. I want you to look at ST segment morphologies also. And when you see that the ST segment is straight or kind of bulging outwards like that, almost like something's pushing up on that ST segment, that needs to make you concerned. Usually you see concave upwards. Concave upwards is a bit less concerning. It can still be a STEMI, but when you see concave upwards, then um, it oftentimes is not associated with the STEMI. Or if, if, if there's no ST elevation, but it's concave upwards, that can be a bit less concerning. However, if you see that there's ST, even in the absence of ST elevation, if you see that the initial takeoff of the ST segment is very straight, or if you see that the initial takeoff of the ST segment is convex, I'm not doing a great job of drawing, but I'll show you more examples of this. You'll notice, you'll notice how 
Let me get rid of all this stuff. You'll notice how this ST segment is almost a little bulging outwards, and that should really make you concerned. Even if you look at it and say it's straight, that should make you concerned. When you see concave upwards, that's reassuring. Concave upwards, that's reassuring. Straight, that should make you worry that something early is going bad, right? So you want to look at the morphologies. You also want to look for a reciprocal ST depression. And a lot of people that said that they wanted to give the patient thrombolytics on that first ECG, when I ask them what made you worry, they'll identify the fact that there was reciprocal ST depression. And oftentimes reciprocal depression can precede the ST elevation. All right. I'm going to talk about both of these concepts, reciprocal depression and morphologies a lot in the coming 15, 20 minutes or so. All right. Again, as I mentioned, beware straightening of the initial port portion of the T wave. I refer to that sometimes as the RT sign. You know, normally the R comes down and it gradually moves into the T wave. That's normal. But when the R comes down and then shoots right out into the T wave, so there's an R and then a T. I arbitrarily call that the RT sign, or it could be an ST sign. When the R wave comes down and then just bam, it shoots right out into the T wave. There's no gentle transition. That should make you worry. And I'm going to show you a lot of examples of that to really hammer that concept home as well. All right. So those are normal T waves. Notice it's nice and concave upwards. When you see straightening, then you've really got to worry about that. All right. And then finally, once again, when you have any concerns, get serial ECGs. And with the repeat ECG, Dr. Chinano was able to nail the diagnosis because it, it evolved into something different, all right? So take home points from case number one, which we're gonna really emphasize in the next 20 minutes or so. ST elevation is complicated. You know, it's not as simple as, ah, just look for one millimeter and two contiguous leads. It's not that simple. And so what else can help you? Well, pay attention to the morphologies of the ST segments, pay attention to reciprocal changes. And then the other point that I wanna make here is, Whenever you're unsure, don't hesitate to ask somebody else to take a look also, whether it's cardiology or maybe a colleague, a senior colleague. You know, joint decision-making is great in emergency medicine. Emergency medicine, I like because it's a team sport and you shouldn't be a cowboy about this. If you have questions in your mind, don't ever hesitate to ask other people to take a look also.